Thank you, Professor Costa. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, delighted to be here back in Avero. Uh, been working with Dr. Margarita Cuevo for many, many years. Uh, I'm a little bit sad that I'm the first speaker after lunch. Uh, so I hope I can keep you awake. And you know, the food was so good. Uh, I hope I stay awake. Uh, at any rate, uh, I was asked to give a presentation, and as a professor, of course, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the research we're doing, which really combines many of the themes that uh, would be discussed in this conference. So my, my topic basically was ideas for low carbon mobility. And what I want to do in this presentation uh, is start with the motivation. You know, if you look at traffic, which is really my area of interest and expertise. Uh, worldwide, we have a lot of impacts that could include accidents, that includes energy use, that includes environmental impacts, that includes travel time and congestion and the value of the travel time to motorists and the society. So the struggle and the things we've been all working on is how to reduce those type of impacts. Uh, in the US, I'm going to give you a few trends of the US. Uh, the numbers are really staggering when you compare them to any particular European country. Uh, on the left hand side is the vehicle registration trend in the US since 1960. And on the right hand side are the motor fuel consumption again since 1960. You see a little dip here. Uh, this happens right around the financial crisis where actually we had a drop in the VMT in the United States. Didn't last very long. The current trend is again on the increase. So from our perspective, um, you know, both in terms of the modal split in the US, and I think this particular slides tell you a little bit more about how dominant auto travel is, is in the US. Number one, 87% of all daily trips are done in personal vehicle. Uh, we take about 1.1 billion trips every day as a country. This data is about five to six years old. It actually may even have increased. Uh, your average person may be traveling around 40 miles a day commuting and doing other type of business. And in terms of number of vehicles, there are about over 200 million vehicles in the US. Uh, and therefore, most of what we see here in terms of modal split, in terms of vehicle use, is focused really on commuting travel. Not only that, but if we begin looking at the energy sector and the source of the energy and the consumption of the energy in the US, you also see a very staggered um, relationship, uh, implying that 71% of the petroleum that, whether it's domestic or um, uh, imported, end up in the transportation sector. Uh, on, the, on the consumption side, it's constitute about 93% of all the transportation uh, consumption coming from petroleum. So again, we have other sectors, of course, the four main sectors. Transportation is a, a, a second one to the electrical power consumption, but certainly quite a lot in terms of uh, the energy use. So uh, talk a little bit about uh, the research we're doing that contribute to, to trying to reduce fuel consumption. Uh, the focus of our research was a non-construction mobility option, meaning we don't want to deal with mobility problems by building more roadway capacity. We're focusing more on how we can reduce fuel use through a number of options. One of them are those four that are listed here to promote shifts in departure time to avoid congestion. Uh, that could include also, some uh, e-work, um, in other words, not traveling to work, but basically working at home, promote shift in route choice, either before the trip is taken or en route, 
promote shift in mode choice, which is probably the more difficult one since the service characteristics of auto mode and transit mode in the US are quite different. And finally, uh, promote shift in driving style to reduce fuel consumption. So I'm not going to talk about all of these, just to give you a sense uh, in terms of fuel efficiency by mode. Um, and again, I just want to be very clear about the units here. This is in quadrillion BTUs. Uh, this is again in the US. These are the different modes, truck, car, buses, motorcycle. And you can see again the dominant uh, amount of fuel use in the auto mode. On the right hand side, we're talking here about mile per gallon equivalent. You can look at this as the efficiency of a particular mode, the fuel efficiency of a particular mode. So while we have a huge amount of use in the car, the efficiency compared to other mode is quite low. Okay? So again, the focus here is looking at even though we may not get huge amount per driver because of the quantity of miles and the quantity of fuel use, that seemed to be the logical uh, approach. So the work we're doing is on driving style and fuel use is funded by the U.S. Department of Energy. We have a group called ARPA-E, which is Advanced Research Project Agency, uh, slash E, E is stands for energy. So they're basically wanna look at all of these aspects. Uh, from our perspective, which is very different, uh, what the ARPA-E folks wanted to do wanted to look at personalized approach, how to reach individual driver, how to reach individual user, uh, directly using some kind of secure communication. Not only that, but we're asked to test the effect of incentives. So if we provide incentive to the driver, information and incentive, will that make a difference in how they drive? And of course, it, underlying all of this has to be very high resolution trip database that will enable us to make those kind of decisions. So, why we focus on driving style? We think it's more achievable than, for example, mode split. We think even some very small savings on the individual driver because of the quantity and the level of use in the US that could still uh, result in a lot more uh, savings. We have done naturalistic experiments. What we mean by naturalistic experiment, meaning we just give people uh, devices, and I will talk about that in a minute, and we just monitor their driving under naturalistic driving. We don't tell them where to go, how fast to go, etc. So this is all in a naturalistic environment. So uh, what is the role of ITS in all of this? The role of ITS really as we know, it's all about computation, communication, big data, etc. And in essence, our system really uh, depends on what we see from the vehicle, what the driver is experiencing, and how we respond or communicate with the driver. This is not very far-fetched. We are in the process of having connected vehicle. And essentially what we're doing here is through a connected vehicle environment where we gather data from the vehicle, the, the data goes to a server, we communicate that data to the driver directly. So let's talk about the methods that we've used, uh, data sources, isolating driving style, eco-driving metrics, and then testing the metrics. Uh, this is actually a collaboration between our university and a company here in Portugal, Live Drive, which is located in uh, Lisbon. They have developed this system called I2D, Intelligent to Drive. It is an onboard device, an OBD2 uh, connector, uh, which is a black box that not only collects data, but also does a lot of data analysis and data intelligence within the vehicle itself. Uh, the data is sent through a mobile network and then communicated back to the drivers. We basically have been collecting data for the past four years. 
we have about 70 million data points. It, we're collecting data on a second by second basis and we're collecting those data. Uh, so let me explain a little bit how that works. So we got our OBD uh, that is sending the data on a one hertz basis, about 40 different variables, not only about GPS, accelerometer, etc. a lot of the engine based variable that will allow us to estimate fuel consumption as well. Uh, the onboard unit is gathering the data, is processing, sending it to the cloud after some computation. Then within our institute, we basically are collecting, we gathering a database, and from that database we communicate through a private website the information about the individual drive. So we're going from general data collection here to communicating with the individual driver. In addition, and that still is work underway, that we, uh, our partner at another university are developing a phone app that would allow you to basically to do the same thing, communicate with the OBD uh, in a real time environment. In other words, after a trip is made, you get direct uh, feedback on your driving style. So, what this really requires us is to be very careful if we're going to have a metric on the driving style that will enable us to compare between driver, regardless of what type of vehicle they're driving. Of course, you drive a high power vehicle, you're going to consume more fuel. So one of the questions here, how we can develop those metrics and making sure we don't penalize people. Well, you could penalize them differently, but from a driving style perspective, we want to make sure that the different cars don't make a difference. Also, we want to make sure that if you have short trips or urban trips versus rural trips, that again, those trips, the fact that you have to make those trips does not penalize you as well. So this table here basically tells us a little bit about some of the uh, characteristics of the metric that we will have to develop. So one of the first questions here that we looked into is this idea of isolating the driving style and vehicle performance. So again, I'm comparing someone who's driving an SUV with someone who's driving a Honda Civic. How, how can we make sure if we're going to compare those numbers that we take into account the different vehicle style. So uh, what we've done here is we've done several controlled experiments. Uh, and you can see here, just to explain what those mean, this is the same driver with different vehicle. This is different drivers on the same vehicle. This is the same driver on the same vehicle. So each one of these, there is variability in each one of these. And what we're trying to test how much variability is there between this case and this case, and how much variability between this case and that case. So what we're trying to do is to, before we normalize everything for the same car, is to make sure that that assumption can hold. So uh, I'm not going to talk about a lot of this data, just to explain to you here, this is the same driver with two different vehicles. Uh, they have different engine size, they have different horsepower to uh, weight ratio. Uh, this is a speed acceleration envelope. And as you could expect, as your speed increase, your acceleration properties drop. What we are finding that regardless of the, um, the vehicle type, what we find was the difference in what the driver uses was not significantly difference between the high power and the low power. That began to give us some level of comfort that we could use a standardized vehicle to compare the driving style without having to worry about which vehicle is being driven. So uh, some of you may be familiar with this uh, graph, which is average speed versus uh, trip, uh, mile per gallon trip efficiency. It keeps going up until it begins to drop at about 55 or 60 miles per hour. Every data point that you see is an individual trip. So we basically have very rich data set that allows us to 
model this quite nicely. And what we've done to, again, make sure that we're not penalizing the, uh, the low value or the low speed trips, we have created uh, uh, CDFs or cumulative distribution function for each speed. So these are low speed trips, these are high speed trips. So for even for any one of these trips, there is a big difference in terms of how you drive and how that affects your fuel consumption. And we've used some model like vehicle specific power to be able to estimate for the standard vehicle. And this is the standard vehicle that we end up using strictly for the purpose of developing the metrics. So the metrics we developed, we call it a fuel efficiency score. Um, this is used both to rank drivers and also to generate incentives. Uh, it's based on 40,000 trips in our database. And then essentially we bin all the trip average speed into eight different classes. So this is what it looks like. I'm not going to go through the computation, but in essence, FES varies between 20 for very low, very low scoring all the way to 100 based on where in the CDF of each trip bin we can calculate. Now, this is in order to be more uh, relevant, those trips, we don't aggregate, we don't give the incentive based on single trips. We actually aggregate the, cr the, the score for trips over a week. So every week, we actually update that score and we communicate it to the driver. Uh, we've tested the, the incentive. Again, each data point here is a trip. The good news here, if you can see, even for low average speed trip, the scores vary from 20 to 100. So in other words, if you have to go through city streets and you, you, know, you have stop and go conditions that have nothing to do with your driving style, we still are able to provide uh, uh, basically scores across the board. And that applies to all the different other speeds. We tested how stable it is. So each one of these plots is an individual driver. And what we're seeing here, you, there is variability from trip to trip, but you can see the trend line is very stable. In other words, it's important that we know before we test for incentives, is that driver improving, that driver is not improving, that driver is stable, and you can see from those graphs uh, that these trips are pretty good, uh, pretty well stable. This is the same thing, but now individual driver and their scores. Uh, again, that high variability even in the FES, but you could see some drivers are on the right-hand side with a very high score. Some drivers tend to be on the low-hand side. So again, we're seeing that this could distinguish between drivers in terms of their ability uh, for fuel use. Incentives, uh, we provide incentive on the basis of, as I mentioned earlier, uh, seven day performance. So we calculate the fuel efficiency score. We weight that efficiency score by the distance. And then uh, in order to again check whether or not we basically divided our cohort into those who receive and those who do not receive incentive. Uh, incentives are based essentially on points and uh, rather again than dealing with an individual number, we have aggregated the scores into uh, five letter grades, A, B, C, D, E. A being the highest score, uh, E being the lowest score. So we discretize the FES into five grades. And depending on where you were last week and where you are this week, those incentives are provided, okay? So in essence, uh, even if you stay at the same score you're not getting worse, you still are getting the incentive. 